everybody, and to paraphrase one of my favorite Doctor Who specials, I am a brown, just not the one you were expecting. I'm Mike, and welcome, I, I never thought I'd say this, to 8 Star Anime on Geek Carolina. Uh, I am here with Damon Waylin, DW. Uh, for folks who do not watch Denzy Caster, uh, this is your first time on 8 Star Anime, so let everyone know who you are and what you do. I'm Damon Wayland. Uh, I do Twitch streaming, uh, twitch.tv slash Damon Wayland. Uh, I hung out with these guys way back when, when they did, what was the other one? Uh, Rage Quit Radio. Yeah. And um, I moved away, it dropped off the radar for a little bit, and I've been coming to visit. And now, anytime I come, I try to hook up and run a review with these guys. Yeah. Uh D.W. here is one of the founding fathers of Geek Carolina. Uh, when Rage Quit Radio started, he was actually the original producer of RQR and uh, the original sponsor of the show as well. Uh, so it's wonderful to have him on any of the Geek Carolina shows. And many, many, many moons ago, I suppose we could say that he is one of the spiritual forefathers of 8-star anime because uh, D.W. here, along with myself, were the original two editors for Mavericks Anime Reviews. Oh, yeah, I forgot about that. So, this is not our first rodeo reviewing an anime together. Uh, Chris uh, was supposed to be here this evening, but uh, he either got railroaded into another shift at work or he broke the first rule of the army, which is never volunteer. Uh, so, regardless, he's not here and we're commandeering his show as a result. So, we are going to try to respect the format. So, uh... Forgive me, Chris, if I screw the pooch on this one. But we have watched Godzilla 2, uh, or if you are basically anywhere outside of the U.S., it is Godzilla City on the Edge of Battle, or City Mechanized for Battle, or it's a Godzilla movie that's got a ton of titles for some stupid reason. But anyway, it's on Netflix. And it's you a Godzilla movie. Watch it. They all have a bunch of titles? Um, most of them only get two, unless they're in advertising. There's... Um, the original Godzilla vs. Mechagodzilla, I think, actually had, like, four titles. So there's a press that seems to have Mechagodzilla. Oh, the yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. There, there is. Because the original was Godzilla vs. Mechagodzilla, and then it was Godzilla vs. the Bionic Monster. But the folks that were sending it out were scared that they would get sued by the $6 million man TV show. So then it became Godzilla vs. the Cosmic Monster for reasons unknown. And then it had one of the, I forget all of them. But regardless, that's not what we watched. There, there is a Mechagodzilla in it. Theoretically. Theoretically. So, uh, this is the sequel to Godzilla uh, Planet of Monsters, which was uh, debuted, uh, debuted on Netflix a while back. There are two different eight-star anime episodes uh, reviewing that, so feel free to go back and check either one of those out. One of them is Chris and myself. The other one is uh, Dave Fleshman, uh, Dave the Head, uh, along with Bob from Logistics, who you see on Rage Quit Radio, one of our uh, players in the Imperium Throne RPG. So, uh, ironically, this was his idea. We originally, we originally planned to watch this when Chris was going to be here, and then when Chris wasn't going to make it, I assumed we were going to wind up watching a second Gamera movie. Well, I assumed wrong. So, since this was your idea to watch, there is a proud tradition on uh, 8 Star Anime. Our tradition on Denzy Casters, we just tell the folks at home if you want a synopsis, wiki that crap. But on 8 Star Anime, they actually believe in giving a little bit of a synopsis, and whoever picks it has to give it. Oh, a little so, bit of synopsis for this. Yeah, so... Um, that's a good way. Good question. <laughs> First off, the movie isn't about Godzilla, believe it or not. This is very much a middle piece for a trilogy. And the first one set up, people come back, battling, battling the monster, introducing characters fast and furious. This one slows down. This one is a chance for you to learn about the different races, mm -hmm. about humanity's place in, in the universe now, uh, about the dangers of the technology, and what does it mean to be human? So this, this one's very much about finding their place. Yeah. To pick up where the last movie leaves off, essentially uh, our hero, uh, Haruo, does find himself alive and well on Earth and in the hands of, for lack of a better term, we're going to say uh, a primitive tribe, or at least primitive by their standards, even though they're 20,000 years ahead. Um Turns out that the original Mechagodzilla weapon uh, from the Bella Saluto, 
Yeah. Um. Anyway. Um. The, the logical Klingons. Yes, they're they're they're, they're logical Klingons. Um. Their Mecha Godzilla weapon has survived and apparently has propagated itself into being an entire city um, through the use of nanometal that was used to create it. And now uh, Haruo, with the survivors of his landing party who have killed the smaller offspring of Godzilla, intend to take out the king himself using Mechagodzilla City, as it is now called, as a massive booby trap. So, on this show, uh, it's called 8-star anime, so they give an 8-star scale. But they break it up into two categories, and you can give a maximum of four stars each. So the first one is tangibles. They used to have this thing called Vaz, which sounded really cool and made <laughs> sense, and it was, it was visual, auditory, story, and entertainment. But then they figured out it's really only two categories. It's tangibles and intangibles. So that's how they do it now. So the tangibles, the visuals, the uh, audio. What did you think of the look, the sounds? What stood out? What did you not care for? I really like the look and sound. But I'm a fan of this particular anime, this production company. They've, they've done Knights of Sidonia. And they've done uh, Blame and a few others. So I really like it. It's a shaded style animation. Uh, it's really clean. It's really crisp. And it has a really high production quality mm -hmm. to it. Uh, the sound in this I thought was really well too. And if you listen carefully, you'll get a lot of call outs to other media or other uh, properties. Uh, you just have to listen for it. It's very subtle. I, 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 I very much think there's a scene where they, they actually pull out the original Alien music just a little bit in the subtitle when they enter Mecha Godzilla City and actually enter one of the buildings it just has that feel and vibe to it. Mm -hmm. uh, there's a little bit of a musical undertone that, that I personally believe is like a call out to Mothra. Because um, this is something that you'll come in as you watch the story. This is very much introducing Mothra as one of the creatures that will be coming up. Yeah, we, we should get this out of the way. This movie's only been on Netflix for a couple of weeks now as we're recording this. So, spoiler warning. Uh, we probably are going to discuss some things that are plot related to the movie. If you don't want to know anything about the plot, um, go watch the movie, then come check out this review. Yeah. Um, visually myself, and I said this in my review for the first one with Chris, when I watched the first one, the, the animation style, objectively it's good, but just wasn't necessarily my cup of tea. Yeah. Um... I think, in hindsight, having watched this movie, I almost think that had more to do with so much of the first movie being set on the ship. And just the way the ship was shown, the way it was, for lack of a better term, the way the ship was lit. Yeah. Um, and, and some of the uh, some of the way that they sort of tried to carry them light off of parts of the ship onto the, the human forms and whatnot. For whatever reason, it just didn't work for me. This one, with most of the movie taking place on Earth and in earthly surroundings, and even in the, the surroundings of Mechagodzilla City to a lesser extent, it's the same style, it's the same company, it's the same everything. They probably made all the movies at the same time. But it came off better to me this go-round. Um, I'm still not a huge fan of cell shading. Never had that. Um, but I, I, it depends on the cell shading. Like... This one I really like, but again, I've been watching stuff that's been done with it, mm -hmm. and it just works really well with the stories they're telling, sure. which I wouldn't put this on like a Gundam. It wouldn't look good. It wouldn't fit right. in that scenario. Right. He, he knows what I watch. Um, yeah. So, uh, from, a, an audio, uh, from an audio standpoint, oh, and I'm going to, one thing I kicked the first movie in the nuts for. Um I've said it once, I'll say it again, at least this movie is not as big of a perpetrator of it as the first one. Shaky Cam does not work in animation. It barely works live action. <laughs> it flat does not work in animation. I know why they did it. And it's more apparent in this movie than the first one. In the first movie, it was trying to make the action frenetic and all yeah. that. And if, if you just keep a clean camera shot and follow a POV or... Uh, you'll get a better sense of speed and frenetic action, for my taste. 
in this movie, they used it more to show the impact of Godzilla Earth, which, for the record, that's actually the official name of this version of Godzilla. It's the first time they've ever given a subtitled name to one. It's Godzilla Earth, to differentiate it from the, the baby Godzilla in the first one, um, which I think is Godzilla Phileas. But I got why they did it. Still didn't like it. But I understood why they did it, and it didn't make me as mad. And it, um, it isn't super shaky like a lot of action scenes where it's right. so This one is boom. Right. It, it's impact kind yeah. of thing. It, it's to give, it is to give Godzilla weight, which is something I will say I think they pulled off fairly well. It's harder to do with that in animation than it is in live action. When you're doing it with live action, there's a, there is a physical weight to something, so it's easier to portray it. Um, in animation, there nothing has weight because it's literally stuff drawn, be it by hand or by computer. It's an animated cell. But the way they they treated it and the way it moved, it Godzilla more or less moved like the dude in the suit mm -hmm. at the speed of the dude in the suit. So it, it had the weight and they played around with it. The way they treated the shaky cam in this was far more reminiscent of the legendary Godzilla. Yeah. Which I was okay with. Um, I said it first one. I'll say it in this one. Y'all had one job, people in charge of the soundtrack. <laughs> one job. And you missed. Um, at least this time you got closer. Um, I'm, I'm almost wondering if the third one's going to be the debut for that. They did not have the Godzilla theme in this. Gosh, they came close once or twice. But they they did not have the actual theme. And there's a palmetto bug in our floor. Um, but uh, I'll let the cats deal with that later. Um, the... I, I I really wish they'd have played it. I thought they had a wonderful moment in the first movie to play it, and I kind of pegged the moment in this yeah. one when they should have went where it would have hit, just been perfect as Godzilla's coming over the horizon, marching toward Mecha Godzilla City. Um, but they also never hit Mothra's theme either. But uh, I will say I really liked the the undercurrent. It wasn't Mothra's theme. But it would have fit in a Mothra movie. Yeah. It wasn't Godzilla's theme, but it sounded right for a Godzilla movie. So they did that really well. Um, what did you think of the visual designs for the... Oh, God, I forgot the name of the tribe already. It started with an H. Um, the... It's Mothra's tribe, yeah. for all intent and purpose. What did you think of, of their look and design? I thought it, it gave them a very tribal feel. It mm -hmm. also made them slightly inhuman I mean mm -hmm. they look human but humans don't have real bright red they don't have real stark white mm -hmm. on their on their hair and arms and stuff so it set them apart so one of the questions in there are they human this mm -hmm. tribe they introduce is are they human what makes them human and that's actually one of the philosophical points that's brought up during this movie and they have this like powdery, they make a big deal of them having a powdery substance that their skin secretes, which would be pretty damn close to the powder that comes off of Mothra's wings, so it's yeah. not a far leap. They never, for the record, use the name Mothra in the entire movie. Um, they're just are suspiciously a pair of twins who talk in sync and telepathically with a giant egg. Yeah. So, we'll let you draw your own conclusions, but I'm willing to bet money that it's not an iguana that was buried somewhere under Madison Square Garden. Um, so, uh, but now, I really enjoyed that. I also, I will say this, one thing for, uh, I, I missed the part, I know they referred to the twins by a specific name, but I missed the name. So I don't know if they called them the, the, this uh, Shobajin, which is the typical name for the Mothra twins, or if, uh, I know they didn't call them fairies. Um, Thank God. Yeah, uh, I, or if they called them the Cosmos, which is the name yeah. in the Return of Mothra movies. Um, but regardless, I did enjoy the fact that they had different personalities. Yes. And they did give a slight visual difference between them. Uh, one of them glares a lot, um, <laughs> which is one of the great lines in the movie. That's how they was able to tell them apart. Um, yeah, Mika. That yes. That's names. So on the, uh, and was there anything that particularly stood out to you as a visual or an auditory thing that you just really, really liked? Um, believe it or not, I liked the vultures in it. 
uh, that would be mine too. I mean, it's like I said, Godzilla. If you saw the last one, it, they did a really good job on him. Um, this whole thing was a think piece. It's not an action movie. So when the vultures show up, that's your action bits, and you're talking about weight and mm -hmm. stuff. Movement in this was really good. Um, mm -hmm. it, a joke came up when Mike saw the the design of them and. Mm -hmm. He was like, oh, God, wing zero. Yeah, and, please and, don't let the wings flap. And, and wings flap, so you have the wings flap and stuff. And uh, this one, it you, the wings make sense. There's a design aesthetic and functionality to them. And the way it pulls off, you you feel a weight behind them. You mm -hmm. feel a movement. The wings shift to glide, to dive, to shift directions really quick. And it's just really, really well done. I like the vultures. I love the design of them. Um Godzilla in this one, uh, you could really make out the intricacies of Godzilla Earth a lot more in this one. In the first movie, it was a little difficult to tell what the, the scales or the skin of Godzilla was supposed to look like. Uh, I had made the remark in our original review, it looked like stone. Um, I've since read up a little bit on it, and I got it in this movie. It's supposed to be more reminiscent of tree bark, mm -hmm. because Godzilla is effectively the highest evolutionary form of a plant in this universe. He's not actually an animal, quote-unquote. He's supposed to be the evolved version of, of Earth plant life. Um, and I love the actual... This goes in the behind-the-scenes stuff. I love the rationale of the creators of this one for why they did that. They are like, well, what is the one organism on Earth that stands strong and stands a test of time for an extreme period of time, and is that tough? A tree. Yeah. So that's what they patterned Godzilla after. You get some of that, and you get... It's the dumbest thing in the world that Godzilla has a goatee. But if you look at it, there's craggy elements that come off his chin that look very much like a beard and gives him a sense of age. So I appreciate that. And I will say I liked... Uh, there's a callback in the movie, if you are a diehard Godzilla fan, there's a callback... During the final battle, as they're attacking him, uh, and what they believe is the final blow when Godzilla is down, you start to see Godzilla glow a bright red, and you even see, and they they show this actually kind of briefly, um, the dorsal fins on the back of Godzilla. In the first movie, Godzilla Earth's dorsal fins looked very branch-like, and they changed it in this one to look, at least from what I recall and saw, in this one, they go back to the more traditional-looking Godzilla dorsal fins. But as he's down, if you look at the dorsal fins, it looks like they're melting. Mm -hmm. That is a call-out, it has to be, to Godzilla versus Destroya. In that movie, Godzilla uh, is suffering basically a nuclear meltdown. And for the entire movie, he's glowing that bright red. And towards the end, as he's dying, spoiler alert, um, the fins, you actually see them start to melt. Yeah. So they, they did a, a really cool callback there. I uh, don't know if you've ever seen Godzilla vs. Destroya. It should be evidenced by the name, what's going to happen to him, but yeah. don't worry, it's got a cool ending. Um, maybe we'll watch it one day after we're done with Gamera stuff. Um, by the way, watch Denzel Caster. So, um, so I really enjoyed the, those visuals, and, but the vultures stole the show. Um, now, something I want I think is, to me is what they did on purpose. When Godzilla... Earth shows up in the first movie. Mm -hmm. It's at the end of the movie. Mm -hmm. I purposely think they obscured a lot of its elements in order to have it actually show up in this movie. To have more of a full day yeah. for this one. And that's possible. It wouldn't be the first time something like that's happened. In, in, I mean, essentially in, they are going to look the same, but he's just, all of a sudden he comes out and they're all, the audience or the people on the ground are shocked, oh God, there's something bigger. Yeah. And everything gets really frantic and that's how the movie ends. Right. So. Um, so, one to four, because that's the first half of the eight-star thing, just on the tangibles, visual and auditory, what would you give it? I'd give it a three and a half. Three and a half? Yeah. Uh, it's about where I'm at. Three, three and a half. I'll mull that over as we go. I just got to figure out if I'm that pissy about them not using the thing. Did you on. like his breath weapon? Um, so, <laughs> yes and no. Um, well... The, I'll get back to the heat ray part in a second. The whole uh, wave, like the sound wave thing, um, 
I've never liked in the Godzilla movie, and they've done it a couple of two or three times in different movies. Um, in point of fact, stupid callback, and I bet this is not why they did it, but that's what the the breath weapon is in the Matthew Broderick Godzilla movie. Yeah. It's actually just supposed to be a sound wave and a lot of hot air. Um, but, so that I've, I've never been a huge fan of. But uh, the actual, I hate the fact they called it a heat ray. Because every other Godzilla thing known to man, it's his atomic breath. Yeah. So why they called it a heat ray here, I'll never know. Um, unless they're trying to say that it's not... Um, that was interesting. Unless they're trying to say that it's not um, nuclear in origin. Which they might be. Uh, but the actual... Like the crackling of the spines, the build up to it, I liked. Uh the slow build to him actually using it was very reminiscent of the legendary version and of Shin Godzilla. Um, the actual beam itself, um, I think I'm okay with it. It's it's really interesting because this Godzilla has a force field. Straight up has yes. a force field. No other Godzilla I know of has had one explicitly stated. Uh... They've been able to generate EMP pulses that do something similar, but but, but not a full-on, he's got a shield. Yeah, and to me, this one is very much his force field is being focused, and then he yeah. shoots it. So that's, that's a very distinct difference, too. Mm -hmm. And it's almost like his breath is directing it, per se, but it's not originating strictly from his mouth. Yeah. It's like it comes in the force field, focuses it, and he just... And that does look a lot like the Shin Godzilla yeah. breath weapon, because if you look at, the, at his atomic breath, it emanates, when they show it in close-up, it emanates at a point in front of his mouth. Yeah. Uh, the fire comes out, and then it, it stops. The fire actually comes out of his mouth, but then you see the beam. I don't think I hate it. Um, I find it interesting that they treat the idea that it can go into space as such this huge to-do with this, oh, oh my God, he can hit, he can hit the ship. There have been Godzilla movies where he can breathe the atomic breath into space and hit asteroids and comets and such. So that's, it's not really new. I think it's just an escalation but, thing. Yeah, it's probably just a thing for the purposes of the movie to go, oh my God, he's that much more powerful than the first one. Um, so yeah, I'm probably between a three and a three and a half. So now the the intangible, the story and just the entertainment value. Uh, the story itself, God, this was Empire Strikes Back. This really was the middle movie of the trilogy, and you are supposed to get that it's the middle movie of the trilogy, and that our heroes, uh, if they were not facing insurmountable odds before, they are now. Um, I still re reiterate, this is not about the Godzilla. It's about everything else around it. it, it really, in this one, Godzilla is a... Backdrop. Yeah, he is the... Godzilla is the world in which this movie happens. Yeah. And that's almost a literal yeah. thing in this movie because they actually go out of their way to tell you as part of the story, no, Earth has evolved itself to serve a single dominant creature, and that is Godzilla. Um, so I, I, from that, that view of Godzilla as the backdrop, it doesn't bother me too much. There have been a lot of Godzilla movies that have played off that. If you go back and you look at the original Godzilla and the original concept from 54, he's the backdrop. He's the allegory. He's the obstacle for humanity to overcome. Yeah. So he's serving the same purpose here. It's just now in a science fiction setting. Yeah. So that doesn't bother me too much. Um, you've read some reviews for this movie because you had watched it before you got here. This was my first time seeing it. Um, why the hell did anybody say this was a love story? Uh, just because the interaction between Hero and that the pilot. Okay. And I don't know necessarily it was a love story. It was one of the things they pinged it. Suddenly these two are getting together when they had no reason to in the previous movie. Again, the previous movie was all about the action. They got there, mm. they're doing stuff. It slowed down finally. Mm. They finally have a chance to talk. Finally have a chance to interact. There is something between them. And I got that in the first movie. Right. I, I the whoever the reviewer was, I don't know why they didn't get it, but so and the other thing is the review I read pinged it for the action, 
And again, this wasn't an action movie to me. No, this was this was very much if you were looking for a Godzilla flick akin to the first animated movie, go somewhere else. Because the first animated movie was action, 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 action. That's what the point of the movie was. With this one, this one actually fell back to being more of a typical Godzilla movie. Yeah. Where it is uh, a lot of human interaction, a lot of story front loaded, and then all the big action set piece stuff happens at the end. Literally 30 minutes at yeah. the end. It, Actually, it's 25 minutes. Cause yeah. We, we stopped there and it was like, oh, we got 30 minutes left. And yeah, it was like 36 minutes. Uh, and five we took minutes a break credits. And came, come back, five minutes, that's credits. And there's probably still another five to ten minutes set up when we got back. Um, so, yeah, it, it's it's very much all the action is on the back end of the movie. But uh, that makes it par for the course for a Godzilla movie. The idea of a love story, I did not get, do not get, will not get. Um, but I'm not, I didn't find the interaction between the two characters a problem either. No. The... The first movie sets up that they have some sort of a, of a relationship, likely a friendship, yeah. from childhood. Uh, this movie the makes it apparent that the female character does have some sort of feelings, uh, be they romantic, probably, or be it the attraction that can happen with the face of certain death. Yeah. Um, but regardless, she kisses him. Uh, which he very obviously is nervous about and doesn't necessarily return. The And that's literally all you get. And there's a kiss, and that's it. And they don't even mention it again. Um, the end with him holding her in his arms and screaming out and going through all the trouble saver, that is, that is one person saving another person that has been their friend from childhood. That... It does not imply anything romantic. It does not imply anything sexual. It does not imply anything other than these are two very close friends. Yeah. And this this is also, again, we talked about this earlier, difference between Asian versus Western perceptions of romance. Mm -hmm. That's the difference. When In America, in Europe, I would assume, when two people kiss on screen, there's a romance there or something should be explored. In Asia, that's not necessarily the same thing. No, not necessarily. It's 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 yeah. There's affection, but duty comes first. Yeah. That that is a very predominant theme among Asian culture. Culture, duty comes first. There may be something there, but it may not be explored. It it struck me their relationship in in this movie strikes me very much as the relationship between um, the two leads in the first Pacific Rim movie. I think the female lead is Mako, and I yeah. forget who the the male pilot is, but. Um, it strikes me very much as their relationship, that there is a rivalry and there is an attraction that you can tell, but the relationship at the, at the end of the day is they are both soldiers and they are partners. Yeah. And that's where it begins and ends. So it, if they survive uh, it, maybe something else, but yeah. And even when they do survive it and they wind up in the, the, the little life raft at the end, they still don't kiss. You don't get anything like that. And I was actually really happy they didn't because I was like, oh, well, that would, would be terribly tropic if they did. Um, what did you think of the, the story overall, the, the whole way this was paced? Because I will say this. Uh, God, this one was slow. Hey, <laughs> it, it was slow, but there was, a, again, it's a think piece, and there's a lot of thought behind it. Mm -hmm. If you get past, past the techno babble in it, What's what makes you human? What makes you monster? I mean, to, the fellow saluted were sitting there saying, "You gotta become a monster to be a monster. You gotta throw away your humanity." That's that was their ongoing theme with it. Humanity is like, if we defeat the monster as a monster, what was the point in doing the battle anyway? I mean, if we're just gonna become a monster, why fight the monster to begin with? We might as well let it have the planet and just move on. Um, and then you got the other race, which I can't remember what they're called, who. Is the religious race? So you got the technology race, you got this religious race, and you got humanity in the middle, trying to figure out where their place is and everything. And the religious race is very much about having faith. Mm -hmm. Have faith in it. it. You will. You will get through this. But I'm almost wondering if they're going to be set up as kind of the villains in the next movie because the Bell Sluder were really the villains in this movie. Yeah, very much. The the way the the story comes off. And you're right, there's a ton of techno babble in this. LeVar Burton couldn't have delivered all the techno babble in this movie. <laughs> um, but 
once you get past the sci-fi trappings, it is a very human story of... Uh, it's actually a very classic trope. It's logic versus faith. Um, it's science versus religion or belief or what have you. Actually, it's a triumvirate in this one. It's logic, faith, and emotion. Because yeah. the, the guy, that, the race that's all about faith are just as emotionless as the Bella Saluda, right. to a degree. The, they don't ping the humans for it, but right. you can tell that they're they're still different. The whole thing in, in this, it's... Uh, a Star Trek analogy would actually be really apt. On one side you have McCoy, on another side you have Spock, and humanity is Captain Kirk. Yes. And uh, Spock is the, is the logic, that's the Bella Saluda... Uh, you have our religious race that is about belief and hope and so on. And there's McCoy. And then in the middle you have Kirk who has to make sense of it all. And that in this case is uh, Haro. Um, I ultimately think by the time all is said and done, the only good guy race that's not humanity, quote unquote, is going to be the tribe. Yeah. Um, and the tribe, if you look at them, the tribe is, I think, very much... They're the third piece of the puzzle, so on one side you have logic, on the other side you have faith. Torn between them you have humanity, and the tribe is showing you how both coexist. Yeah. Because the tribe does act from a certain logical standpoint, and they use the same weaponry that Bella Saluda does in a different way, because they're using nanometal. Yeah. But they have a great deal of faith in their goddess. And I, I, so they say God. I say goddess because, by goodness, it's Mothra. Um, and Mothra is a, the only female kaiju, like, top shelf one in the Toho pantheon. Um, so there is that. Um, the only yes, it is a slow burn, but it is a, um, it's still moving along, even though it's a slow burn. There's a lot of thought into it. The one thing I did not necessarily care for really is the Bella Saluda in this. Yeah. And I say that because they come off as... Trying to have it both ways, they are they preach logic and so on and so forth, but in some ways they're more emotional than any other race in the movie, except maybe humanity at points through uh, Haru, but it, where they are so warrior driven and so aggressive, uh, logic does not always dictate aggression. Yeah. And so it, it seemed like that that's what I when they, I said out there, they're logical Klingons. They're they're almost exceedingly prejudiced. If you don't fall within their logical definition of what is sentient, mm -hmm. they look down on it. It, it that you're you're lesser than an animal. They look at the tribe that way. Yeah, one point they, it's like we'll just kill them. They're not they're not sentient. We don't need them. They're not an intelligent race. Yeah, and that's that's the trapping of logic itself. You can use logic to explain anything away. Yeah. And it, it actually shows the flaw in logic. And I think they, they represent that very well. Um, the only other thing that somebody out there I think is going to knock this one for, and you can, and if you do, you're... I hate to say it. If you do, I'm sorry. You're wrong. Um, I can see people knocking it for the story just being weak and bleak. And the bottom line is... is it's part two of a three-act play where your heroes, uh, to put it in wrestling in wrestling parlance, this is where you take heat. This is where the heroes get their ass beat in order to make the triumphant comeback in the last yeah. movie. Uh, there's a reason that Darth Vader beat the dog shit out of Luke in Empire Strikes Back. It's because Luke had to come back and make the big heroic save at the end of Return of the Jedi. Um, so... That's what the movie sets up. That's the, that's the other thing that I've, I've actually seen people complain about it. My only com my biggest complaint story-wise is I actually wanted to see Mechagodzilla. Yeah. I, when they had originally mentioned it early on, I was hoping to see it. And you, and there's you don't actually, really see it. And here's the thing. At some point, I think, we, we were, I think they were thinking about it because there's a toy of Mechagodzilla as he appears in this world. There's full designs of him, everything. And the fact that we didn't get it uh, does upset me a little bit. I really wish we'd gotten Mechagodzilla. I'm more mad about that than not getting the theme song. Um, <laughs> because the designs, as I've seen them, 
were ex- exceedingly unique. Well, here's here's the thing. Let's 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 throw out some theory craft in here. What if he comes back in the next movie? We don't have three monsters. We end up with four. Yeah, that's possible. And it's it's distinctly possible. Yeah. Uh, it, it, I, I, I fully expect the next movie to be all battle from from probably 30 minutes in on. Mm. I, I feel like there is a part of me that, uh, for one, I really hope these get a Blu-ray release. I kind of doubt they will. They will. Oh, all, they will. All, all the Netflix stuff comes out on Blu-ray. So one of the things I'm really looking forward to doing, it's going to be a day to do something like this, but I really want to watch all three back to back to back as a single piece because that's where it's going to make the most sense. Yeah. This the second movie will not stand on its own unless there's a third part put in. Yeah. The first one could stand on its own. Yeah. It it, it leaves you on a cliffhanger wanting more, but it is a complete story. Yeah. You there is no complete story here. There is no triumph in this, this one. This one is filling out backgrounds of everybody so that when the third movie comes around they can resolve the dilemma that's introduced in this one so entertainment value uh i'm gonna give it a three it's middle of the road it is a slow story it is a slow burn um there's a lot of techno battle battle to it it's a good thing if you like that stuff Mm -hmm. but for a vast majority of people i think this is going to be the i'll watch this once and then be done with it and maybe come back to it when the third movie comes out well, now, you've watched it twice willingly. But I like that kind of stuff. <laughs> I mean, That's fair. I like Clockwork Orange. I like Brazil. I like uh, The Zero Theorem. Uh, and all these movies are painfully well, and, and, slow and, and tedious. Yeah, and, and I'm the guy that likes Seven Samurai, Field of Dreams, and Patton. Yeah. Serial, so, serial Experiments Lane. I mean... Yeah, that's all you, brother. Um, eventually, I, yeah, I, I like I like the stuff that's a little bit hard to get through for most people. You, you were about to invoke the name of Evangelion, were you not? Yeah. Yeah. Great show for 25 episodes. <laughs> and episode, they waited till episode 26 to let you know they ran out of money. I repeat, watch the movie. Yeah. The movie, <laughs> skip the TV show. Um, so, for me, overall entertainment value, um, it's a good flick. If you watch the first one, it's a good flick. If you watch it by yourself, you're going to be, by itself, you are totally lost. Um, I'm going to wind up, your overall score is going to be six and a half, so it goes three and three and a half. I, um, this movie, if I'm scoring it by itself, is probably a five. And I say that because it absolutely, positively will not stand by itself. No, it will not. But judging it as part two, having seen part one, I'd give it a six. Um, cause I'm going to, I'm going to ding at a point for, for failure to properly employ the Godzilla theme again. And I I'm going to, there's a licensing issue with that. There can't be Toho owns the music. Um, so now, but technically they're not, they've given the right for a company to produce it. No, this is, it's them. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's actually a Toho production, um, because it's the only way Toho could get away with it. Yeah. Um, we, we had mentioned that on our Denzi Caster Shin Godzilla episode. Go check that out. Um, but it's also, uh, I'm also I, I, from a, a, an entertainment standpoint, I really am that disappointed that we did not actually get Mechagodzilla. We got Metroplex, but we didn't get <laughs> Mechagodzilla. Um, and that actually does does bother me a little bit. That they The advertising for it, a lot of the hype for it, was around the concept of Mechagodzilla, and I wanted to see, uh, I wanted to see a three hundred meter tall Mechagodzilla. See, this is a case where I'm glad I wasn't watching a lot of the pre stuff. The hype train. Yeah, I didn't watch. I, the trailer came out. I watched it, and that was it. I didn't read up on anything else on it. Yeah. So I, I think that actually benefited me. It, could it, it probably does. So, closing thoughts uh, for myself. No, folks, it, it, this movie does not stand by itself. So, if you are a Godzilla fan, you're willing to sit through the slow burn, knowing full well that movie three is coming, and knowing, if you were smart enough to watch through the end credit sequence, that uh, there is a certain three-headed winged Hydra coming, um, then I think this is straight up there. It's actually a very good second act to a three-act play. 
Um, I'm looking forward to seeing Ghidorah. I'm looking forward to seeing Mothra uh, because they, with Godzilla, made some really interesting design decisions that were really cool but took full advantage of being an animated medium. And God, how awesome could an animated King Ghidorah look. Yeah. So I'm looking forward to part three. If you like Godzilla, you want to sit through a slow burn, watch part one, watch part two, they're good. If you just don't care and you're thinking about just watching this movie by itself, don't. No. <laughs> just don't. No. Your final thoughts? Uh, I'm going to have to agree with you on it, on your points all, all across the board there. Um, don't watch it by itself. I, I would never recommend anybody do that. Watch the first one. Watch the second one. Um, be prepared for the slow burn. Um, try to enjoy what's happening behind the scenes instead of what's happening with Godzilla. I think yeah. you get a lot more out of it. If you're going in just for Godzilla, it will be disappointing at that point. Yeah. Um, and, and I agree with you. I think part three is going to be... Uh, part three is basically going to be uh, the fi animated version of Final Wars. It's going to be wall-to-wall -wall monster fighting from beginning to end, uh, or at least wall-to-wall -wall action. It may not be wall-to-wall -wall monsters, but there's going to be... Do you, do you know what the third one's called? I do not, off the top of my head. Okay. Uh, I'm sure it's got a title. It does. <laughs> but, it does. I've seen it. I've just forgotten it. Um, um, I think it's something about space. Yeah. I forget what. But, yeah, the, the I'm looking forward to the third one. Um, have you ever seen Godzilla Final Wars? Yes. Okay. Yeah. It, it's just nothing but just balls out action for like an hour and a half. And that's what I'm expecting out of this uh, for the third movie once it comes out. So, uh, and they don't ask this uh, on on their show regularly, but uh, I assume you, it, so. yes, I, I assume you agree with me. This this is not part of the of of the starter kit for anime no. fans. No. <laughs> no, I mm. wouldn't even put the first one in that category. <laughs> this this one, if you're a Godzilla fan, it's definitely worth seeing. If you're a fan of this animation style, if you're a fan of Blaine, Knights of Sidonia, this is worth seeing. Um, mm. Silly question, because I haven't kept up with a lot of recent anime. Um, what if somebody comes in, if, if they're... I think you, if you're a fan of mecha anime, you'd actually yeah. be able to go on with this. Um, the vultures were damn cool. Yeah. How close would this be to something like uh, Attack on Titan? Attack on Titan. Um, That's the only other giant monster anime I can think of off the top of my head. It's not even comparable. To Attack on Titan. So if someone liked that and they were like, well, this is another giant monster anime, this probably is not going to fall in that it's, same way. It's not going to cross-pollinate very well. Okay. I mean, it's... I've, I've watched Attack on Titan, and I'm not a big fan of it. I'm, mm -hmm. I'm watching it more from a... I've watched the first two seasons, so I'm going to watch the third season now. <laughs> um, if they never produced the third season, I wouldn't care. Ah, fair. So, um, I would say more along the lines of... If you're if you're an Evangelion fan, I think you would get more out of this one. Yeah, um, um, maybe, maybe. Uh, but again, that's not a starter either. No. Um, so this this is this is very much once you've watched and got your taste down, you jump on this one. Or if you are a Godzilla fan, I yes. will say if you are a Tokusatsu fan, you are a Godzilla fan. Um, you don't even need to be an anime fan for that. Yeah, you really don't. Um, though I I do think. If you are a tokusatsu fan, you could throw this on the list of, um, I want to tip my toes in anime. Because it's going to be familiar. It's, it's Godzilla, yeah. but you'll get to see a little bit of anime in the process. So, folks, we want to thank you so very much for joining us on 8 Star Anime. That just sounds weird. Um, but thank you so very much for joining us. Uh, DW, tell them where they can find you and what you do and, and all that good stuff on the interwebs. I'm a Twitch streamer. Find me on Twitch TV, Damon Wayland. Uh, I got some stuff on YouTube as well. Uh, I'll be dropping in here every couple months to do more stuff. So you'll always find me here at some point. Yep. You'll be a, a frequent guest star with us. I uh, made the joke on a lot, one of our more recent episodes of, of Denzy Cash. I've even donated stuff to help his production quality on his... Uh... He has. Uh, wait till you see some new live episodes coming up of some of our RPGs. Uh, we're going to be doing some really cool stuff with that too. Because um, after all, when there's trouble, we call DW. Um, so, uh, thank you so very much for joining us. 
Please share, like, subscribe, all the wonderful things you do here on YouTube. Spread the word about 8 Star Anime. Let everybody know where they can check out Chris and the gang. We are not the normal two fools you're going to see on this show. In fact, you may never see the two of us together again without somebody else, unless Chris decides to flake on us again. Um, he's not. Um, but uh, thank you so very much for joining us. Uh, do, if you want to help us out, check out our stores. That's redbubble.com slash people slash geekcarolina or cafepress.com slash geekcarolina. Links down below. You'll find the links to David Waylin's uh, Twitch channel down there as well. Uh, if I can remember, I'll put one to his YouTube channel down there too. And uh, of course, jump over to our Facebook page, facebook.com slash geekcarolina. We've got some giveaways coming up on the channel. When we had 150 subscribers. We're going to be doing another giveaway. Uh, we've got some cool posters sitting over here beside me that if I can manage to keep him from hijacking them and taking them all back to Tennessee, we'll have some to give away. So, folks, until next time, for Damon Waylin, I'm Mike. We'll see you. Well, Chris will see you on 8 Star Animax.